past seven months, I've been thinking about studying different book in God's Word. So, previously we've been studying the book of Ephesians, but we finished with the book of Ephesians. So now, I wanted to, I was like, okay, what about this book, this book, this book? So I thought, okay, let's study the book of First Thessalonians. So T-H-E-S-S -S is Thessalonians, it's my abbreviation for it. It's an amazing book. It's filled with hope. And the point of my message this morning is living the truth. So we need to ask ourselves, are we living in the truth? Or not. So there are ways that we do this, and one of the ways we live in the truth is we imitate Jesus Christ. We're to follow the teachings of Christ. We're to talk the talk. We're not just to talk the talk, but we're to walk the walk as well. Do you do that as you follow Jesus Christ? Why don't you ask yourself this question this morning? Jesus Christ himself is truth. Secondly, I want to ask, I want you to ask yourself, do you keep commitments? Often people say, you know, I follow Jesus, I'm saved, but do they actually live it out? And then the question is, sometimes, you, you know, the question is, do you actually practice what you preach? The third point in, in living the truth is, do you speak the truth? Jesus emphasizes in the book of Thessalonians, in his book of First Thessalonians, and there's also something more. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, a person says, I'm a believer. I'm, I'm in fellowship with Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. But you walk in darkness. Suppose you walk in darkness. This means like, I say I believe in Jesus, but when I go home... I do private dark deeds. I'm involved in sin in my home. I can't see what goes on in your home. I can't see what you do in your house. I can't, you know, peek in and spy in your window and see what you do in your home. Like a thief, sicko, trying to be all nosy, looking into everyone's lives. trying to figure out what people do. I don't ask you what you do in your personal life. If a person is in obvious sin, I would recommend them and encourage them to repent. But in your home and what's going on inside your heart, in your mind, those things are personal. So sometimes people are like, I follow Jesus Christ, I love Jesus Christ. But their life is in darkness. They walk in darkness. Notice what this verse says. So if you do that, if you walk in darkness, you lie and do not live out the truth. You're a liar. And there's another verse in 1 John chapter 7. It goes on to say, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, just like Jesus Christ, we walk in the light just as he is in the light, we live a holy life. We live a pure life with pure thoughts, with a pure heart. Just like Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin.
if a person is really involved in sin, but they say, no, I don't have any sin. Let's see what this verse says. This verse goes on to explain that phenomena. It says, if we claim to be without sin, oh, I don't have any sin, I'm good, I have nothing to confess, uh-uh, nothing wrong here, I'm great. Because we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So there's a person who says, oh, I'm, really, I'm in love with Jesus Christ, but in their secret life, they're involved in sin. And then there's a person that says, I have never, I don't have any sin, I'm good. So we see the differences. But verse 7 says, this is a very interesting verse. People who are involved in sin, and, and then there are people that say they have no sin. Both of these people are liars who are walking in darkness. The one that walks in darkness and, and says they have fellowship with God. And, you know, mission in missions work, Paul was the first to admit, I am the chief of sinners. He says it over and over again, I am the chief of sinners. But he was greatly used of God to preach the gospel and travel the world, and he would say, no, 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 I am the most filthy of all sinners. I have violated God. Because the closer and closer you get to God, the more and more you realize how much sin you have in your life. And you notice that pull, that spiritual warfare of flesh versus spirit. Paul says, I wish that my body of flesh would be completely dead, but until you die, until you're buried in the ground, there's going to be a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. But when we're in heaven with Jesus Christ, we'll have a new body. We won't have to worry about that anymore. We are definite. I'm looking forward to that time. That time when there won't be any more struggle with sin. So we see in Acts chapter 17, verse 4, and it's written to believers... Jews and not and Gentiles, both that lived in Thessalonica. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 4, we um, we can we can see where that is um, where that church was founded. And so there's a purpose for this epistle. And there's first and second Thessalonians, and we are stutter, studying first Thessalonians, which is chapters one through five. Paul wrote them to praise them for their steadfastness under persecution. They were suffering. They were experiencing many horrible trials. People were bullying them. People were treating them horribly, but they stood steadfast. And so he praised those who stood steadfast under persecution. Second of all, Paul's second purpose was to instruct them in holy living. And he emphasizes this. God commands and he desires that we have a holy life. In 1 Thessalonians, it explains that we must have a holy life. And he says you can't be on the fence about it. You must live out a holy life. And people had some misconceptions. They thought Jesus' second coming had already happened. The people there were like, some people were teaching that Jesus had already come. And so people would get all panicky and, and they would start, they would stop working. They would, they would, they were going up to a mountaintop in anticipation of Jesus Christ. They would sell all their homes. They sold everything that they had. They said goodbye and they traveled to a mountain. And they were literally standing there waiting for Jesus to come. So Paul wrote this letter to correct misunderstandings. Yes, we are supposed to watch and pray for Jesus Christ, but you're supposed to continue to work, you're supposed to support your family, you go to church, you be involved, until God takes you. And it's he, he that decides the time. But somehow, some people had this misconception, and you know, even today, Jesus is coming! Oh, really? And people get ready, they sell all their homes. I mean, this happened way back when, when I was younger. What was his name? 
Mither. Um, this was a guy, and he uh, said that Jesus was coming back in the 1800s, 1844, and so many people were excitedly waiting, and Jesus did not come. <laughs> it happened way back in the 1800s, and again, it happened in our times with a Jehovah's Witness um, religious leader that said Jesus was coming at a specific time in like 1989, and and then, oh, 1914, Jesus is going to come. And they kept making all these predictions and spreading it. And their followers and different churches um, said that Jesus Christ was going to come. Uh, the Mormon church has had a history of doing the same thing. And different religious people, you know, and then people get all paranoid. And they start changing their behavior because they truly believe this. But it's a wrong interpretation of God's word. And, you know, the exact same thing was happening in the town of Thessalonica. And so Paul writes this letter to warn them, you think Jesus Christ has come already? He has not. Some people believe Jesus Christ returned in AD <coughs> when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, that Jesus Christ came. Some people even reported that they sit, saw him and then they said, oh, in 80 AD, but no. And so there are many misunderstandings about the second coming of Christ. And so Paul takes a moment and he says, no, 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 let me clarify the truth about this. And so Thessalonians actually explains and helps us to understand more about the second coming of Christ. And it's wonderful. So when Paul was there, <coughs> in Thessalonica. He taught, he, and he wrote these letters to them because he wasn't able to be there for very long. So he wrote these letters to clarify estological. The idea of estological means future events. Estiological means, there, because it was talking about how the trumpet will be raised and we will all be caught up together with Jesus Christ in the air. He'll come like a thief in the night. And so he explains this uh, end times theology. And he explains that. And so some people were like, what? When is Jesus coming? Has he already come? And people were confused in, in Thessalonica about this. But it really helps them and it helps us today understand those misconceptions and understand about Christ's return. Paul wrote this letter. <coughs> To the church with all these people being Thessalonians and in 1st Thessalonians chapter 1 we believe that it was written from Corinth and sent to the church in Thessalonica and we read what it says here so he says Paul Silas and Timothy, all three of them. So we know that Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was one of the leaders, and he believed that Christians were teaching a fake, fake religion. So he went out to capture those, and he went out and captured people in different cities. He imprisoned people. He punished people. He even had people killed for the faith, the faith in Jesus Christ. He had great authority. He was one of the chief leaders of the Pharisees. He was on his way to Damascus, but he was met by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, in all his glory, appeared to Saul, and he fell down as if he were dead. And Jesus Christ spoke to him and said, I am Jesus Christ. You are persecuting my people. But today, I'm going to call you, and you're going to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So that the Gentiles would know of Jesus Christ, and he said, so Paul fell on his knees. He fasted for several days. He mourned, and he was blind. God sent a servant to heal him, one of his servants to heal him. And after that, his heart was on fire for the Lord, and he preached, and he was so zealous about it. In fact, people were, like, stunned by this because Saul? 
This one who was a Pharisee, he persecuted, he killed us, and now he's become a believer, a follower of the way? People couldn't believe it. And some people were very skeptical. They were like, no, he can't be following Jesus now. It took a while. But Paul went in and he built relationships with people and they realized, wow, you know, maybe he had imprisoned their family members. Maybe their family members had passed away because of Paul and his sin. Maybe Paul had even had members of their loved ones, you know, killed. But God called him to be a missionary to the Greek world, to the Greek and Roman world of that day. And he preached the gospel he set up churches all over the known world at the time. He was the first traveling missionary. We also see Silas. Silas was a very important leader in the Jewish community. He was a skilled teacher and a prophet. Paul and Silas worked together. Prior to this, Paul and Barnabas had worked together, and they had founded churches. And then Paul went on a journey again, and something happened, we're not exactly sure, but Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement. They had a very big disagreement. They were not getting along, and Barnabas wanted to take John Mark um, Paul's cousin and they thought, no, that wasn't a good idea to take John Mark with us and join us on our missionary journey. And there was some kind of disagreement that happened. And Barnabas ended up taking John Mark with him. And the two of them traveled a different route. And Paul ended up becoming a companion of Silas. And so Silas, you know, he's one of the second greatest missionaries to travel the world at that time. And also Timothy. He was a very young Oops, sorry, can we go back in the PowerPoint? Not done with that. Thank you. And there was Timothy. He was a young missionary, very young, a young guy. He met him. His father was a Greek and his mother was a Jew. And he was from a prestigious family. And he ended up joining Paul as a young man. And they traveled the world together. And so Paul taught Timothy. And Timothy became one of the greatest leaders in the church of Ephesus. In fact, the pastor of the church of Ephesus was Timothy. It's amazing to consider that these three, they were a team. They worked together. And they, they were writing this letter to the church of the, the Thessalonians. And people would often think a church is a building, but a church means this group of people who have been called out as believers in Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. We are the church. The people are the church. Today, people think, oh, an actual building with a cross on top. That's a church with decorations, but that's not what a church is. A church is you. You are the church. The body of believers. Each individual person. That's the church. So Paul explained, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be to you. Paul preached the gospel, and God had founded this group of believers. God is the one who established it. So oftentimes people think, I establish it, but it's God's work. And we need to be humble and just be his humble servants. So we see the we see the on this map the travels that Paul and Silas and Timothy took and the second missionary here that we speak of of Paul and Silas as they traveled through all of these different places that you can see here on the map until they ended up at Thessalonica. 
and it was one, it was um, under Roman rule at that time. It was, it was um, like the capital of the state, you know, like downtown where you have the capital of the state, you know, of California, and you can go in there and you can see, it's a gorgeous place, isn't it? You can see the, the beautiful marble on the floor and all of the ornateness that is in there. It's gorgeous, isn't it? If you haven't been there, then you really should go. But it wasn't quite like that in Thessalonica, but it was set like at the top of the country at the Roman rule, and they had established their rule there, and there were like all of these buildings with pillars and, you know, many, many different things that had been established. A very famous town that it was. But again, it was under Roman, Roman rule at that time. And then we see here, and, and I want to impress upon you, in this particular area that we here, have here in Thessalonica, we see that they had set up four different churches, four different synagogues. And this is the sign that we use for synagogue. As synagogue, we use an SY like this. But it was a building, it was a temple, and many people would go there uh, because they could read the Old Testament there. It would be read there for them. And it was in a scroll, in the form of a scroll, but either you know, open from top to bottom or from side to side. And it spoke of the laws, and all of the writings that had been put down in there, the different psalms everything that was on these scrolls. And the Jewish people would all come together and they would also study those in the synagogue. So you see here, and it's interesting to see all of the people in the background and around, and then you see the person who's, who's doing the preaching and, and has the scrolls himself. And Paul would go there and he would preach to all of these people that would come. And so you see the pillars that I was describing and, and the building and how the building was built in the synagogue. You know, how they had those pillars that would hold them up. And the people would come. And there were many, 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 many different readings. And it wasn't only in Jerusalem that they had such a temple as well. But they also had them in the different towns, in the different cities all over that particular area. Especially those that were under the Roman rule. Different ways, different places, different synagogues where people would gather. <coughs> And you, know, you may wonder how it is that they actually got started, but historically, when the um, city of Jerusalem was built, and then to the east was Babylon. And remember that the Babylonians came and they destroyed the Jewish temple. And they took everything, they stole everything, and made slaves of all the people and brought them to their own country. Remember that in Babylon. And that was in, in history, remember that? And that was like back in like in the year 70. Because they had come and they had invaded and had gone into that building. And then the leaders of that time that had built it. And then when when that temple had been done, then they decided to establish more temples all over, you know, when their servitude was done and everything was finished. And then there were Greeks and there were Romans and, you know, throughout all of that area. And, and the Jewish people would come for this. So the missionaries would travel to all of these different places and go into the different synagogues and they would do their teachings in the different synagogues. So it says in Acts, now in Thessalonica, in Thessalonians, when you go before that and you read more chapters of, of different um, books of the Bible than it, than it speaks about all of these places that were the missionaries that were, were coming in all of these different towns. And it's really interesting reading. But it says in Acts, it says, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. You know, Paul and, and Timothy and Silas, they had all come and the leaders were there. And then they would preach. They would preach about Jesus Christ and tell the people about who Jesus Christ was. So we look at this and we see on this slide here in Acts chapter 17, verse 2, it says, as was his custom. In, you know, what Paul was used to be, used to doing, you know, after he had rested, he would go to, into the synagogue and then he would preach to all of these people. And then it says here, 
he went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them, he explained to them the meaning of that word is that you know he would teach them, discuss with them all of these things. From Isaiah, in, like the writings of Isaiah, who spoke of Jesus and how Jesus would die. He would be there and he would, he would be teaching the people that. Of course, he wasn't teaching in the New Testament, from the New Testament, he was teaching from the Old Testament. But they, you know, were studying this, and they would read this, and they would look at this, and the, and the people would look and they would compare it to how things had been in the Old Testament to when Jesus was born. And this is what um, Paul would speak about for three consecutive Sabbath days on three consecutive weeks. So it would be like all day Saturday because most Jewish people would go to the temple at that time. And even those that those that didn't yet believe in Christ, you know, for, for the one week that he would teach about he would teach to the people and those that had become believers and then on that weekend when they would all come together in the synagogue so that they could hear him preach some more. Now the explanation that Paul was saying, and it was very important, the points that it was that he had to make, Paul explained to them about the crucifixion and about the tomb, how Jesus had been entombed, and then how he rose again from there. And it says here in verse 3 of Acts 17, it said that he was explaining and proving, he was giving them the evidence that they needed, that Jesus Christ had suffered. He had to suffer on that cross. And he explained this and discussed this with the people. And not only that, but that he rose from the dead. And the reasons for all of this discussion were in the book you know, we have these books, and we can go back to the books of Isaiah. And we can look in the books of Isaiah, and we can read all of them. And they would go back and they would read them too, about the sufferings, about how Jesus was crucified. And that had been put down in the books, from the time of Isaiah all the way down until when Christ had actually suffered all of this. And remember now, they were probably like about 500 years that had occurred from I, between Isaiah and from the actual happening of Christ dying on the cross and rising again. So Paul explained this all in detail. Because there was always discussion in the Torah and sometimes the people would just be taken aback by what it was that he was saying you know, about Christ's death. And this was the gospel that Paul was preaching. And here is an awesome thing. I mean, he would tell them directly. He said, this Jesus that I am speaking to you about is Jesus Christ. He is the one. He would proclaim it to all of these people that this was the Christ. And so it's also interesting, you know, in the Jewish language, you know, how the Jewish people spoke. They spoke in Aramaic, which is a, a beautiful and powerful language. And, and the Jew, there were other Jews that spoke Hebrew as well. And, and there were some languages that were spoken in Greek and Latin and all of the different languages. It really didn't matter. The, the point of it being was that he was saying was that Jesus was the one, that he was Yeshua, he was the savior. He was the one that had come down to save the earth. And then he was the one that had paid the debt. He was the Messiah. He was saying that the Jesus that had been crucified had been anointed as the Messiah. And he tried to explain this clearly because this was the way that he spread the gospel of Christ. And he did it vehemently and he did it zealously. And people would look at him and they would be stunned. You know, and some of them would, would believe and some of them did not believe. <coughs> so it says here, in this verse here, some of the Jews, some of the Jews were touched, some of them believed. 
or some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Because remember, he was preaching to great crowds of people. And some people afterwards would follow him to learn more, to take in more of what he was teaching. Because for a week he would teach, and then, you know, the three Sabbaths he would preach as well. He would continue with his preaching and teaching these people because he wanted the Jewish people to be saved. And we see also, it says that there was also a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. Because there were many women that were involved in this as leaders. I mean, strong women leaders. Now we see nowadays, like in our Congress, we see men, but we also see women becoming leaders more and more and more. We see this happening in the United States. You know, sometimes it's like half women, half men. So, you know, sometimes we don't, who knows? I mean, it may be soon enough that we have a woman president. We don't know. But, you know, it will be God's decision when this really happens, who he will choose and he will put in that place. Because we know that Hillary Clinton has failed, and, you know, we don't know whether she'll decide to go try again in 2020 or whatever. You know, it depends on how many votes she gets and, and how this works out. But, but what he's saying is that in that time, there were some very important influential women that were also convinced as well, that listened to him who were taken with the word, who, who became involved in it, and in how Jesus Christ lived, and then how he died, and how he rose again. And they heard him, and they too were saved. So it's very important when we see that they listened to the truth. He offered them the truth. You know, he pointed out how this had happened in the Old Testament, exactly, and how it led to Christ. And that was the truth, and it was clear. And many people at that time were saying, Greeks were saying, you know, important men, influential men were saved, and women as well. So we see how this went on, and they became very zealous about hearing the word. You know, wondrous, wondrous blessings, and they were so happy at that time. But still, you know, there were problems that faced them, as we can see here. Now when we look at this and we see, if you look down at these people who are, who are sort of haloed in red, it says, the Jews were jealous. Why would they be jealous? Why would you think that they would be jealous? Because the numbers who believed in Christ were growing. You know, when you would enter the synagogue, usually, you know, you would have like a small, elite group of Jews, and now all of a sudden there were all of these people who were there you know, who were supporting Paul, who were supporting Christians, people who believed in Christ. And this angered the Jews. It said that they were jealous. So what they did was they went around and they formed these factions and they talked about these people. And then it says that they rounded up some of the bad characters from the marketplace. People who were against Paul, people who were against Silas. These leaders would round up all of these people. And they formed a mob. A mob of all of these people who would revolt and would be rebellious. And they started a riot in the city. This word here a riot in the city. People yelling and screaming and throwing things, stones. Because, you know, we don't know, but, you know, if you've ever seen these rebellions or these revolts or these things that, you know, happen in, in riots in different places, you know, people take cans and bottles and, you know, they, they pour these fluids in these bottle Molotov cocktails and they throw them again, you know, throw them into the crowd and it creates such a riot and a, such confusion and it's just awful. So they were doing the same thing. This is what the Jewish leaders were doing. They wanted these people to incite the other people to a riot. So it says that they rushed to Jason's house. They all rushed there as a group because they were looking for Paul and Silas. 
And they went to this man's house because they had been there. Remember now, they stayed there in one place for three weeks, so they needed a place where they could stay, and different people would welcome them in and invite them in. But they went to the door, this mob is running to the door, and they're pounding on the door, and they're screaming at these people. And they were searching for Paul and for Silas because they wanted to bring them outside and into the crowd. You know, they were looking for them. They couldn't find them. They wanted to capture them and take them out. And you know, who knows what it was they wanted to do to them, harm them, kill them. For telling the truth. For explaining the truth. For helping them to understand the Old Testament and how it related to Christ. The good news. Many Jews did believe, but not all of them. Not all of them believed. So it goes on to say, they were searching for them, wondering where they were, where Paul and Silas were. But they were hiding. But it says, they couldn't find them. They wanted to catch them. But when they didn't find them, they took Jason and some of the other believers. And they said, he's a follower of Paul and Silas. Can you imagine the yelling and the screaming and the shouting and everything was going on? And they were saying, these men have caused trouble all over the world. They have caused such chaos to happen. So much troublemaking. And it says, and Jason has welcomed them. He's welcomed these dissenters into his house. And they are all defying Caesar's decrees. Saying that there's another king. One who is called Jesus. Because Paul was telling him that Jesus was the true king. And these people were angry. They were beyond angry because they were thinking, they didn't want Jesus as a king. They didn't want to take down Caesar as a king. But Paul was telling them, who would you prefer? Who would be the righteous king? And all of these people. Remember when Jesus was, was being accused as well, and they were asked, who was it that they wanted to release? And they said, Did this king of the Jews or Barabbas? And they said, no. We don't want him as our king. We don't want him as our king. We want the Roman king, Caesar. That's what they were saying now. And all of this goes back. I mean, you can go back and Greek towns and see that. The same mobs would come and say, no. We don't want Jesus as a king. We want the Roman rulers. What an awful time that that was. Verse 8 says, and when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Verse 10 goes on to say, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. The whole town was in an uproar. And so they decided, um, it's best, Paul, you and Silas, please go to Berea. Go to another town. Go to Berea. Because... And I think the lesson for us here is to recognize that the truth is not easy. We need to stand and preach, and some people are going to feel upset by the gospel. They are going to be like, hey, that's not okay. They might report to the police. They're annoying us. And the police might say, hey, stop. 
like, hey, I'm out on the street. I'm just preaching the truth. I'm preaching the word of God. Please leave. Go to another area. If a person was to stubbornly stand and continue to preach, they might be imprisoned. It happens in America. It happens in this country. I've seen it. Years back, you know, people might accept God's word. In the 1800s, there were many revivals that happened in churches where a pastor would get up and preach and many people would come stand just in the middle of the town and people would come here. They would have a wooden platform and a person would stand up on it. With a gas light nearby in a street corner and people would preach in the 1800s and people would hear and their hearts would be changed and they would follow Christ. And there were many lives changed, but today standing on the street corner is not allowed. And people would perhaps throw garbage or try to abuse a person or try to hurt a person for doing that today. So we see the change, and this is not new. This happened in Greek times where people were imprisoned. But it's important that we live the truth. We are not to be silent. We're going to share the truth. We are to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we are silent, we are rebelling against God. We are rebelling against Jesus Christ's commands. We must imitate Christ. So I want you to ask yourself, are you living in the truth? Maybe a person says, oh, yes, I am. I'm imitating Jesus Christ exactly. I do what Jesus does. I preach. I teach. But if you do, you're going to experience persecution. You're going to experience personal injury. And it's going to happen more and more as the times change. And maybe 15, 10, 20 years. You know, people who are leaders in Congress, the Republicans and the Democrats, there is a deletion of the Ten Commandments, a deletion of following God. You know how people used to um, swear an oath on the Bible, and, and there was a Bible they put their hand on it and say, I do solemnly swear to uphold the Constitution under God. And they want to take that out, remove under God, so that there's no word of God. The world is changing, it is. But as Christians, we must stand strong in the truth. And we see the example of Paul, how he went through terrible persecutions for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you, God. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. God has such a big heart and he gives us such a good shepherd. First Thessalonians, it says, we thank God for you always, making mention of you in our prayers. These believers in Thessalonica were experiencing a lot of persecution, and so he goes on to say, we continually <coughs> remember you before our God and the Father, your work produced by faith. They were experiencing trials, and Paul was praying for them. He 
he talks about how their love prompted your labor prompted by love and your endurance endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ this church was enduring and this was inspired there was they had hope in Jesus Christ he wanted them to persevere As we continually remember you before our God and Father. We're not saved by ourselves. We're saved by God, and he changes our lives. We love him and we follow Jesus Christ. We have passion to serve him. Faith, hope, and love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll look at that verse next. It says, and now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. When we look and we see that Paul said that they are continuing to remember these people, and we know that God's command was that he told us to love one another. Love our enemies and to keep going, to keep continuing with the practice of this love. And it's interesting as we look at this in this first Thessalonians chapter one, verse four. Here we go. It says in this verse here, it says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that God has chosen you. Of the believers, he's saying, God chose you. He chose your church to be a part of the body of Christ. He picked you. He picked you. He is the one that established this church. He is the one that brought you all together. And then when we look at this, when we think, we picked God. No. Oh, that's God's work. Everything is done to his glory. Amen? Amen. So a little bit in conclusion, a little something more to think about. As we go through and we're going to read also through um, verses 4 through 8, through this book of Thessalonians, there's so much, it's a wonderful book to read, and it can help us in our lives, help to give us hope, help us with our faith, help us with our love. <coughs> to look at this also in terms of these particular verses. You know, before we go on with the remembrance of the Lord's temple. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, all the way down to 13, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, not only to the people of Jerusalem in the synagogue of Jerusalem, but to all of those people he's saying in all of the different cities. It says, It teaches us to say no to the things of the world, to ungodliness, and worldly passions, and to live a self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. And verse 13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we look to Jesus Christ, our God, to come again. And verse 14 goes on to say, Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, his beloved people, who are eager to do what is good. And verse 15 says, these then are the things that you should teach. Encourage and rebuke one another with all authority. He says, encourage one another to turn to Jesus Christ to his commands, that we live a life of truth. Because in Matthew, in chapter 8, it says, now from heaven to earth, it has been given to me. And we know all about Jesus' teachings. They have been given it to us. And the very last line says, do not let anyone despise you. It's important that we look to Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is the one in whom we can believe, the one in 
whom we can trust. He is the truth, and we can stand strong on his truth, not waver, not keep ourselves quiet, and not share. No. Move forward boldly and spread the, the gospel. Tell the world. If you're in school and college, or me, you know, when I was a kid, kid myself to tell that, you know, I, it, it's, an, it's just not right if you don't share the Bible. You have to go in and share. Tell the stories. No, tell the things that you remember. I remember way back when having a discussion in class. You know, somebody was, you know, telling about the truth of Jesus Christ, and somebody else was just was was just against me, and I was just stubborn and kept through it. Because you have to continue to spread the word. You know, with all the laws that are told about. Has, we have freedom of religion here in America. Freedom to worship as we will. Even though they want to stop it, even though they want to take it out. They can't force me to be quiet. They can't force me to, to put my arms down and not share the gospel. I will continue. And I will continue to pray for America. Because the time is coming when things are going to change in the world. You know, the leaders, they're they just want everything taken out. And they want to force us to become that way. These are the persecutions that we are suffering. These are the torments that we are suffering. But nowadays, we are free. We still have this freedom. So we can have freedom to study. We have freedom to encourage one another. But the time is coming. The time is coming where we may be silenced, where it will be illegal for us to do these things. So it's important for us right now, for all of us in our lives, to share this truth. Do you share the truth? Do you share the truth at this table?